2 Timothy chapter 4, and beginning at verse 9, down to verse 22, the end of the chapter. This is the last message of the Apostle Paul to the churches of Jesus Christ. These are his final words. He said, no more. This was it. He was executed shortly after. And thus what he says in the closing words to me are highly significant and important. I don't know what you think about the salutations that you often find in the New Testament, but you know, people are important to God. Crowds are important to God. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, but so were individuals, and he never lost sight of that. And in the New Testament, though there are multitudes coming to Christ, I think it's very fascinating to read individual names of people that were important and precious to the Apostle Paul and to all of God's people. And this is an example. Let's start at verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And under the general heading of to him be glory forever, which is found in verse 18. But let's start at verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Antichicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed at Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Last words of the Apostle Paul. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, I pray in these few moments together that you will quicken our hearts to give you glory, that we might see a man who faced execution for his faith in Jesus Christ, pouring out reasons why we all should glorify and praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what the test or trial or circumstance of life, there is a reason to praise and glorify your holy name. And may that be in every heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The key to this whole passage, as he summarized it, is certainly verse 18. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I see three reasons in this passage why Paul could give glory and praise to God. And I hope they'll be a blessing to you. Let me just list them for you, and then we'll go through them. One is his struggles and disappointments. That's found in verses 9 to 16. His struggles and disappointments were reason to give glory and praise to God. Secondly, in verses 17 and 18, the strength and deliverance of the Lord, certainly a reason to praise God. And then third and finally, the support and delight of Christian friends. That gives reason to praise and glorify God in the last four verses. Now let's back up and take a look at verses 9 to 16 about his struggles and his disappointments. And there are three things that I would draw to your attention there. One is that they demonstrate the importance and value of friends. They demonstrated the importance and value of his friends. In verse 9, he wants Timothy to come quickly. Don't waste any time, Timothy. Get here as soon as you can. Now, he left Timothy in Ephesus. And I've often asked the question, did Timothy ever make it? Good question. Timothy, come quickly. I need you, brother. Come I'm alone, and a lot of people have deserted me, and Timothy, you're a dear brother and son in the faith, and man, get here as quickly as you can. Did he ever make it? Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and let me give you uh, David's view. I can't be dogmatic on this and say it's the Lord's view, 
because uh, I really don't know. But I have an opinion about Hebrews. Uh, you know, the author of Hebrews is a contested a consideration. That is, some people believe that it's an unknown author. Some believe Apollos wrote the book. The vocabulary is very much different from other epistles of Paul. So a lot of people do not believe that Paul wrote the book. I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book. And I have many reasons for that, but I'm just going to give you one. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, excuse me, not 12, 13, look at verse 23. Paul said, or the writer said, know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Now, I have the feeling that Timothy made it to Rome and because of his identification with Paul, got in prison. Otherwise, it's hard to explain this statement. Why does he say our brother Timothy has been set free if Timothy, in fact, had never landed in prison? And it's very possible that the reason why Timothy was put in prison is because of his identification with Paul, that he did make it. He came quickly, saw Paul. Uh, they saw his identification with Paul and knew that he was a disciple of Paul, arrested him, but he was set free. And this could possibly be a remark following uh, the record in 2 Timothy. We don't know that for sure. It could refer to a previous imprisonment because we know Paul was in jail twice. Once in the Praetorian guardhouse, according to Philippians chapter 1, and once in the Mamertine prison or dungeon, that's when he wrote 2 Timothy. So it's very possible that here's a reference to Timothy who had come to see him. That's possible. Not conclusive, but it is possible. A lot of people say, well, it's not possible because Hebrews, dealing with the sacrificial system going on in the temple and talking to Jewish people about uh, the problem of supporting it after Christ died, they say that couldn't be because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, so the book of Hebrews had to be written before that. No problem to me. I believe the Apostle Paul died somewhere before 70 AD. He had to die before that uh, for a lot of reasons in terms of the chronology. Uh, Nero was in power. Uh, Nero was the Roman emperor. By the way, in 64 AD, he burned Rome and blamed it on the Christians and possibly put a lot of pressure upon Paul and therefore did not allow the release of Paul. I think he wrote the prison epistles around uh, the years of 63 AD, possibly 2 Timothy around 67 AD, when I think is probably the year that Paul died, some three years before the Roman invasion uh, of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, just an interesting point, but let's come back to 2 Timothy. Uh, we can't be conclusive about it, but Paul starts his whole discussion with, come to me quickly. If you read this over and over again, just as you're looking through the text, you can feel the heart of Paul. You can feel his disappointment. You can feel the struggle that he feels. Here he is in that rat-infested cold dungeon, and nobody will take a stand. Nobody will be with him. And he's lonely, and he's discouraged, and he wonders about the ministry that he has uh, been used of the Lord to develop all over the empire and wondering where the people are. Timothy, come quickly if you can. And then I notice he, he quickly moves to some other friends. Demas. You know, Demas is mentioned in a good light in Colossians 4.14, Philemon 24. But here Paul says in his last letter, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world or this present age. That one remark is a warning to all of us. Somebody can be a friend to you and be even a, a co-worker in the ministry and, and indicate they are a disciple of Jesus Christ, but in fact, because of the pressures of the world, all of a sudden they forsake you and they are now in the world. The word has forsaken me is a compound Greek word that indicates that he simply would not take a stand with the Apostle Paul knowing the pressure that Paul was under. He would not identify with Paul. He could not make that commitment. Why? Because he loved this present age a lot more than he loved the Lord. Isn't it interesting that verse 10, when you compare it with verse 8, is such a contrast? At the end of verse 8, he says that there's a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give to all who love his appearing. He loved the present age more than the appearing of the Lord. So did not sense his accountability to the Lord, but in fact, the present age pulled his heart away. What a discouragement to the Apostle Paul. But his struggles and disappointments did demonstrate the, the importance and value of friends, even in terms of those who forsook him because he saw the blessing of those who stayed with him. 
Now, at the end of verse 10, he mentions Crescens and Titus. And uh, Titus, there's a whole epistle to him. Crescens, we don't know much about in the Bible. But these two, we don't believe forsook Paul, that you shouldn't make that connection. He's simply saying that they're gone. They're departed. They're not here. These are my friends, but they're not here now. So, Timothy, come as quick as you can. I need you. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. I don't know what you think about this, but that phrase is really powerful. Only Luke is with me. Who is Luke? Well, he's a Gentile and he's a physician. Here's a Jew and Gentile that became bosom buddies. Luke wrote Luke and also wrote Acts. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 10, you have the first introduction of the fact that Luke is with Paul. Up until that time, there's no evidence. But from Luke 16.10 to the end of the book, every time you have a discussion about where Paul goes, he says, we, the writer Luke, was with Paul and a traveling companion. Now the question is why? One, he led him to Christ, possibility. Uh, Some believe Luke is the man of Macedonia that asked uh, uh, Paul to come help, that he challenged Paul to do that. I don't know that for sure. But I know that Luke was with them. He was a physician, and Paul had many troubles. He had an eye disease, we believe. Uh, The Bible speaks about in one passage that his bodily presence was actually disgusting to people who looked at him. He didn't look like much. And uh, he speaks about how with such large letters he had to write. And some believe he had an eye problem, possibly the eye problem that was picked up on his first journey, missionary journey. And it was a serious problem. Uh, He had a lot of physical problems. We also know he spoke in Galatians of the marks that were in his body from the constant beatings that he has. He was stoned, left for dead on one occasion at Lystra. And the man is beat up. I mean, he is a mess. And yet he keeps going on for the Lord. And I think it's a precious thing to realize that here Dr. Luke stayed with him. And I cannot help but believe that Dr. Luke spent most of his time patching up that man's wounds and trying to keep him healthy for the ministry. And I'd like to say a good word for all the doctors who do the same for all of us in the ministry. Amen? And if you don't want us to send us a bill, that's fine too. Praise God. (laughs) But anyway, Dr. Luke was used of the Lord, and I just love the fact that in the last closing days of this man's life, when he's in the Mamertine prison and knows he's going to be executed, that Luke is such a faithful brother that he didn't worry about what it would mean to his own life, but he is there with Paul in his greatest need. Now Paul, the aged one, as he calls himself, he's way up in years, his health is not good, and he's going to be executed. And Luke says, hey, Paul, I'm going to be with you till the day you die. And what a sweet thing to say, only Luke is with me. The struggles and disappointments are there, but there is cause to praise the Lord in the midst of it all. And thank God for men like Luke who sticks with you through all the varying trials. The next statement in verse 11 is interesting. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Back up, please, to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. John Mark, interesting man. You know, one of the early church prayer meetings met in his home, according to Acts 12. He had Lots of reason to understand the Christian message and the whole issue of discipleship. And uh, he's related to Barnabas, who was the original choice of the church in Antioch to travel with Paul on their first missionary journey. But something happened. Acts 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him, take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So Mark started out on the first missionary journey, but backed out for some reason. Paul, having an elephant's mind, never forgot. Verse 39 says, the contention became so sharp, the argument, that they parted from one another. You know, if, if, if somebody today wrote the Bible, they would never have put that in there. You know that. They would have said everything was peaches and cream. And they would not have brought out the human frailties and weaknesses that the Bible does. The Bible is very honest. Paul and John Mark 
were arguing so much, it was so difficult, so sharp, that they split from each other, and Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. I'll never forget the joy that filled my heart the day I was standing in Cyprus and saw the ancient evidence of Barnabas and John Mark. That church on Cyprus still, uh, that Orthodox church, still looks back to the founding of its church by Barnabas and Mark. And I can remember seeing that and saying, just feeling joy in my heart that God, even though they split, God used both teams for his honor and his glory, even though they couldn't get along with each other. And then you wonder, well, is this ever going to get straightened out? And here now, Paul, way up in years, in a Mamertine prison, a dungeon in Rome, and one of the things he says is, by the way, could you get Mark? The word get Mark or take Mark in Greek means to pick him up on the way. What he's saying is, Timothy, I know you're leaving Ephesus and coming all the way over to Rome. I want you to come as quickly as you can, but on the way, would you pick Mark up? Because he's useful to me for ministry. What a neat thing to say. Paul, I believe, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, realized that God used John Mark. And in spite of the split that they had, uh, he had a lot of disappointments, and he was disappointed in what John Mark did. But you can see the graciousness of the work of the Holy Spirit in Paul's life as he realizes that Mark has been used of God. This tells me that God can pick anybody's life up and use them again. Amen? Well, back to 2 Timothy again. The struggles and disappointments were there, And they demonstrated the importance and value of friends. But there's something else I draw to your attention that the struggles and disappointments happened to affect in the life of Paul. And that is that they directed his sense of justice toward the Lord's will. There is a very important statement for all of us found in this passage. Tychicus he had sent to Ephesus to replace uh, Timothy in verse 12 and verse 13. He wants his cloak. That's an outward cloak that keeps you warm, made of goat skin usually, and could ward off a lot of the cold of winter. Uh, He asked that Timothy would bring the books and the parchments, uh, probably not simply writing material, but the fact is this probably refers to Old Testament scriptures as well as some of the writings that he himself was doing. Books probably refer to the sheets of papyrus, Uh, which he himself was writing his New Testament epistles on. The parchments, which are on vellum or animal skin, probably referred to Old Testament passages. And and what a thrill to realize that in his age and his sickness and weakness and uh, his coming execution that he didn't fold up. I like to share this passage with people who are in convalescent hospitals or are laid up and think that they have no purpose. Don't ever lose sight of your need to grow and to understand the Word of God. And here in this hour of his deepest need, he said, hey, make sure you get the Word of God to me because I need those. Bad. Bring them with me. But in verse 14 and 15, we see that the circumstances of struggles and disappointments in the life of Paul with many of his friends and co-workers actually directed his sense of justice toward the will of God. He says, Alexander, the coppersmith, literally the one who works with metals, did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he leaves it with the Lord. And he also warns Timothy, beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. I like this in the life of the Apostle Paul. I don't know who the Alexander is. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's possible that it's the same man here. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Alexander is a common name, so we need to be careful about identifying it too closely. But in 1 Timothy 1.20, this was an Alexander who gave him trouble. He says that these men had, concerning the faith, suffered shipwreck. Verse 20, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Possibly that's the Alexander. By the way, when he was at Ephesus... According to Acts chapter 19, there was a mob in Ephesus filling that arena, that amphitheater, which, by the way, still stands today. It seats 25,000 people and is perfect acoustically. I stood in that theater at the bottom and had some of the members of our tour group go all the way to the top, to the top row, and I simply spoke without microphone in a normal voice, without yelling. 
and they heard as clear as a bell in the top roll. It's absolutely incredible, the acoustics of that ancient amphitheater, 25,000 at seats. Can you imagine what it was like to have that place jammed with people who for two hours shouted, great as Diana of the Ephesians, and tried to overpower the Christian witness that was going on in Ephesus? According to Acts 19, there was a man, a Jewish man, whose name was Alexander, whom the crowd called in front of them, and uh, he tried to give an answer, but they drowned him out. We don't know whether he's the Alexander. It's possible, because he's writing back to Timothy, who's now in Ephesus. It's possible he's referring to that same man, who perhaps because of the pressure of that mob, realized uh, the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, he might have also been involved with the metalworks of Ephesus. We do know that a man named Demetrius caused a lot of trouble to Paul because he made silver shrines uh, to the god Diana to keep the history of that place going. And when you look at it, you realize what a business that was. Corrupt, uh, sensual, perverted, and uh, making a lot of bucks. And because Paul preached the gospel, a lot of the efforts of, of this industry uh, were suffering. And that's why the mob. And it's very possible that Alexander, the Jewish man who would not take a stand or perhaps backed off from the pressure of that moment, is the same Alexander that's here in 2 Timothy. We just don't know. But the interesting thing is that Paul said, may the Lord repay him. You know, it's important that we don't seek vengeance when people wrong us. And, and I see that all of his struggles and disappointments, of which Alexander was one, directed his sense of justice toward the Lord's will. You have to leave it in the Lord's hands. And that's what Paul is saying as an old man in the dungeon and saying, hey, I want you to be careful about Alexander, but remember that the Lord has to take care of that. The Lord must repay him according to his works. There's a third thing about his struggles and disappointments I want you to see in verse 16. And that is that they developed a spirit of meekness and forgiveness in Paul, even at an old age. His struggles and disappointments developed a spirit of meekness and forgiveness, even in his old age. I read in verse 16 an amazing statement by this elderly apostle and statesman of the church. He says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. Can you imagine what this man must have felt? All the lives that he had affected, and there were many Roman believers. Let me just tell you, when Paul was arrested to come to Rome, the believers actually walked a long ways to meet him and to encourage him and to wave to him from afar. And, and that's recorded in the book of Acts. There were a lot of Roman believers. Paul writes about them in Romans chapter 16. And out of all these people and all the people he worked with, no one was willing to take a stand with him. Now this is talking about an official defense, and argument in front of the Roman authorities for what he was preaching and doing. Arguing that the Lord of our lives is Jesus Christ. That Caesar is not Lord of all, Jesus Christ is. And the Romans were demanding that everybody submit to Caesar as Lord. Paul refused, and his influence was incredible. At his first defense, not one person stood up with him, possibly fearing for their own lives. He says in verse 16, all forsook me. Talk about sensing. He not only is alone, he is lonely, and no one is with him. Timothy, come quickly, because everybody has forsaken me. Only Dr. Luke is here. That's quite a statement. But look at the end of verse 16. May it not be charged against them. Turn back to Acts chapter 7. Let me give you an example of that. There's a spirit of meekness and forgiveness in the heart of the Apostle Paul that's developed because of his struggles and his disappointments. A spirit of meekness and forgiveness. Look at Acts, please, chapter 7, verse 60. Here is the stoning of Stephen. What an occasion that is. Paul was there. According to verse 58, when they stoned Stephen, the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I find it fascinating that this young man, Saul, who heard Stephen say that as he's being stoned to death, is saying the exact same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Lord, do not lay this to their charge. Only this time, he's not talking about unbelievers stoning him. He's talking about believers who did not have the courage to stand up and give a word in his behalf at his first defense before the Roman authorities. Have you ever been disappointed? Have friends not stood with you when you needed them? Our struggles and disappointments are a reason to praise and glorify God if we see what God does through them. They certainly demonstrate the importance and value of friends. And when there is a Dr. Luke, thank God for them and show the whole world how special they are to you. Do they direct your sense of justice toward the will of God or do they make you bitter? Have friends disappointed you and discouraged you to the point you are now bitter and resentful? And you say, if that's the way people are going to treat me, I don't want anything to do with this. Or do they help you to reevaluate all that is happening to you in the light of the Lord's will. And are you able to say, hey, the Lord's going to take care of it. He's going to settle all accounts. I don't know what the reasons are. And do they develop a spirit of meekness in us and forgiveness? Can we see that God can take a mark who left you once, but now has proven his ministry and cause you to say, hey, he's useful for the ministry. Can they help you to say about all those precious believers that you led to the Lord or influenced for God, who wouldn't stand with you in a crisis, can you say, I forgive them? Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. What I'm saying to you, it's easy for you to put out of your mind saying that happened 1,900 years ago, but my files are filled, including this church as well, with people who are having a difficult time forgiving friends who have hurt them. It is a major problem in Christian relationships. We believe because we all know the Lord that somehow we will never hurt each other. But if you've lived long enough and you've been a Christian long enough, you know that simply is not true. It hurts when it comes from a friend who says they're Christian and that they somehow love the Lord. And yet behind your back, they say something or they say something that's uncalled for, unjustified. You're being misrepresented or slandered. What do your struggles and disappointments do for you? Are they really a cause to praise and glorify the Lord? Can you really leave it in the Lord's hands and say, God be praised? I don't understand it. I don't know why it happened, but I'm not going to let this get into my heart and destroy me. That's so important. Let's come to a second matter. To him be glory forever. Struggles and disappointments, yes, even then. But let's come to a second reason to glorify and praise God, and that's in verse 17 and 18 of 2 Timothy 4. And that's the strength and deliverance of the Lord. I read in verse 17 that Paul said, even though other people wouldn't stand with me, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Three things I draw to your attention about the strength and deliverance of the Lord. One is that God's purpose was fulfilled in the Apostle Paul through all of this. He says in verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. God's purpose was to have the message get preached. Do you know that he's in jail because of that purpose? And I'm really encouraged by that. No matter what happens, God's purpose was being fulfilled. Now let's back up and take a look at that. Turn to Acts chapter 9. See, Paul knew very well that that's exactly what God was doing in his life. So why should he be bitter or complaining? Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 15 and 16. It says, but the Lord said to him, this is to Paul, right after he was converted, the Lord said to him, go, For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Hey, suffering was a part of it. Struggle, problem, pain, heartache was a part of it. And what was God going to do? To bear my name before Gentiles. What's the next word? What does it say? Kings and the children of Israel. 
God is going to use all of his struggles to actually get him in front of kings and witness for the Lord. Interesting. Now take your Bibles and turn to chapter 23. Chapter 23 and look at verse 11. God's purpose is being fulfilled in Paul's life, no matter what he went through. And in Acts 23, verse 11, I read an interesting thing. Paul is on trial, and he's in the barracks. And the Bible says, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Do you know what his lifelong desire was according to the book of Romans? It was to go to Rome. He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Imagine the seat of the imperial government in all of its glory and its prime with Nero the emperor. I want to go and I want to proclaim the gospel in Rome. Little did he realize that God was going to do it by arresting him in Jerusalem. The man for months is on a terrible journey of experiences to get to Rome and God has one purpose to fulfill. That man is going to bear witness for me in front of kings, including Nero, who flayed people alive, lit them up like torches in his gardens for his orgies at night, who hated the Christians with a passion, who murdered his wife and mother-in-law and many relatives because they professed faith in Christianity. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 22, Paul says, All the Christians greet you, all the saints greet you, chiefly those that are of Caesar's own family. Imagine going to Rome and through your witness, people in Nero's family have come to know the Lord. And history records he murdered many of them because of faith in Jesus Christ. What a statement. I like this. Paul, wondering what in the world God is doing, is arrested. He's in these barracks and everybody's against him, it appears. But the Lord said to him, be of good cheer. As you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness for me in Rome. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So no wonder he says that his last words in 2 Timothy, that the Lord strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. I want to ask you a question. You live in America and I do too. If you lived in a country where there was no freedom for the gospel, and were arrested for your faith, which happens all the time to believers in this world, what would you think about the purpose and plan of God? Would you see it as an opportunity to share the glorious good news of Christ? Or would it cause you to clam up or even deny your Lord, lest you suffer beyond what you were able? These words are very important for us. We're one of the few societies in this world that have the freedom to sit here and talk about it as we are. Sometimes I think we, we don't even want to think about the Christians all over the world are in jail for their faith. One report I saw recently is that there are hundreds of thousands of them. That almost seemed too hard to believe. Hundreds of thousands of believers living right now are in prison for their faith in Jesus Christ. We know there certainly are a lot of them. And many of them are being killed, and many are being tortured, and many suffer for their faith. What about you? Where do you stand? Have you been reading through this and kind of skipping along in your mind saying, that's not me, that's not my problem? Where do you stand? You see, God has a purpose in everything, and his purpose was being fulfilled, and that's encouraging to all of us. The second thing I draw your attention about the strength and deliverance of the Lord is not only that God's purpose was fulfilled, but God's protection was fulfilled constantly manifested to Paul. Nothing's going to happen to any of us that God doesn't want to happen. We're all going to die on time, and all that happens is a part of his plan. Look at what he says at the end of verse 17. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, what happened here? He says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, did Paul get thrown to the lion's we know the Romans did that, and at the games, they loved to do that. Not just the gladiatorial contest, but the highlight of the games was to watch some people in there get mauled and chewed up by lions. Now, was Paul cast to the lions? There's a lot of people who believe that, because he said, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I find that hard to believe for one reason. According to Roman law, no Roman citizen can ever be thrown to the lions. And I have a very difficult time since they knew Paul was a Roman citizen. He says so several times. 
I just have a hard time believing that he was thrown to the lions in the light of that law. It's possible they set aside the law for a moment and put him in the arena, and it's possible God delivered him from an actual lion. Uh, that's possible. But I just have a hard time believing it. He was a Roman citizen. Another view is that the lion refers to Nero. So the idea, I was delivered out of his hand, so to speak, that Nero is the lion involved here. I find that hard to believe because, in fact, Paul was not delivered from the hand of Nero and suffered martyrdom and death under his hand. That doesn't help me either. What does it mean I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion? It's possible that it refers to Satan. Does not 1 Peter 5, 8 say that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? So the lion he's talking about could be the enemy, Satan. And he's saying, I was constantly delivered, even though Satan is using the enemies of the cross to try to get me, I'm being delivered. That's possible too. Take your Bibles, please, and uh, turn to Psalm 22. It's also possible that Paul is using some scripture that was very common among Jewish people to talk about the deliverance of the Lord. And it comes out of Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm. That means it refers to the Messiah. And actually, some of the words that Jesus quoted on the cross are found here. Some of the things that happened to Jesus, like piercing his hands and his feet, uh, are in this passage. About dividing his garments and casting lots for his clothing. They're all here in Psalm 22. Things that Jesus fulfilled when he died on the cross. But I want you to look, please, at verse 19 of Psalm 22. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. In other words, they're graphic pictures of the Lord's deliverance. And when Paul said, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, if you're Jewish, you say, amen, God's deliverance is great. You do not think that there's a literal lion, but just as Daniel was delivered in the den of lions, just as King David was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, it becomes a wonderful thing to Jewish people of God's deliverance, no matter what the circumstances. That is very possibly what Paul is saying, that God was constantly delivering him out of the mouth of whatever trial he faced, the lion being used as a metaphor, an illustration. Back to 2 Timothy again, chapter 4. We said the strength and deliverance of the Lord is a reason to praise and glorify him. One, because God's purpose was fulfilled, and two, because God's protection was constantly manifested in Paul's life. And the third thing I draw to your attention is in verse 18, and that is that God's preservation is also promised, and therefore Paul could rejoice. Let's suppose we do get killed. Paul said, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. No matter what happens to me, God's preservation takes me all the way to heavenly kingdom and my hope in the Lord. So to him be glory forever and ever. So what? What if they wipe you out? So what? What if they kill you? The fear of man is a snare and a trap. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Have you ever had your life threatened? I've had that happen many times. What do you do? Has anybody ever picketed you and wanted to just beat the tar out of you? You say, yeah, when we were kids growing up. No, I mean now. Has anybody ever done that to you as an adult? Have you ever been threatened? Have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been in a country where you did not have the protection of the American government and realized you were in big trouble? I don't want anybody to raise their hands, but I know there are people here who have been through this. And it's downright scary. And all that confidence that you have as an American citizen all of a sudden dribbles out the door, and and you feel very insecure. Do you feel like trusting the Lord at a moment like that, or do you feel like running away to Tahiti? When I read this, I realize that there's something about all of us that causes us to back off when there's a little pressure. You know, this could happen at work tomorrow with just somebody not wanting you to open your mouth about Jesus anymore. And you know what Paul's saying here? No matter what happens, no matter what happens, no matter what threats, no matter what trouble we're in, God will preserve you until his heavenly kingdom. So what are you worried about? Paul knew that death was a release into the presence of God. Do you? Do you know that when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord? Do you believe that? 
That is so important to get into your heart. God's going to take care of you and preserve you all the way to heaven. So why are we sweating it? Why are we concerned? God's going to take care of us. Turn back to Psalm 121 for a moment. Psalm 121. Look at this wonderful psalm. Psalm 121. The Lord is going to preserve you and take care of you. Psalm 121. David said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Lord's going to take care of you. Why are you worried? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. No matter what happens. Back to 2 Timothy 4. We said there are three reasons to praise God. One, the struggles and disappointments because of what we learn from them. And secondly, because of the strength and deliverance of the Lord. He's promised to take care of us. The third thing is the support and delight of Christian friends. Is that a reason to praise the Lord or is that a reason to praise the Lord? Has God given you you a Christian friend or friends? The Bible says better is a friend who is near than a relative who is far away. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, says Proverbs 18, 24. Proverbs 18, 1 says that a man who isolates himself comes to emotional ruin. Are you trying to walk it alone? Part of the joy of the body of Christ are Christian friends. The support of Christian friends is a reason to praise God. And I want you to notice several things. One, according to verse 19, his relationships were really special. I read that Prisca and Aquila greet you. That's what I read. Do you know about those people? Romans chapter 16. Let me read this to you. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Talk about special friends. And he writes at the end of his letter, Aquila and Priscilla. Will you greet them? Timothy, just tell them that I love them. And how about the household of Onesiphorus? Uh, Flip back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, the first chapter, and remind yourself of what he said in verse 16. Talk about relationships that were special and a blessing. He mentions Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila, and now Onesiphorus. Verse 16, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Talk about special friends. Every time I'm with this guy, he refreshes my soul and my spirit. He builds me up. He encourages me. And he was never ashamed of my chain. It didn't bother him to come to jail and to minister to me. I just want to thank God for him. Would you greet him? 2 Timothy 4 again. Not only were his relationships special, but his remarks revealed his concern for people. If you really have special friends, and you're going to be concerned when they're in need. He said in verse 20, Erastus, according to the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 23, Erastus was the treasurer of the city of Corinth. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus, who was an Ephesian, from Ephesus, I have left in Miletus, an island off the coast, and I left him sick. By the way, Paul said he had the gifts of healing, but evidently he couldn't exercise it in this case. Uh, He left him sick. He couldn't do anything about it, but he's showing his concern. Here he is in dungeon, and he's facing execution, and he's telling Timothy, by the way, don't forget about Trophimus. He's on the island of Miletus. It's not too far. You can get a boat and go over there. He's sick. Send somebody over there to minister him is why he's bringing it up. Trophimus, I left there sick, and I, I don't want to forget about him. Paul's remarks revealed his sincere concern for his friends at times of need. By the way, let me tell you something about Erastus that always blesses me every time I see that name in the Bible. I had heard before I took my first trip to the city of Corinth years ago, I had heard 
that in the excavations of the city of Corinth, they had found Erastus' name in Latin letters on a slab of stone in front of the amphitheater. Now, when I arrived there the first time, which was in 1970, uh, they wouldn't let us go visit where they were doing excavation work at the amphitheater, at the ancient city of Corinth, though many of uh, the ruins of Corinth are now available to people to see. But they wouldn't let us go over there. And so I was frustrated. I went back a couple of years later, and uh, I wanted to, you know, look into that again. And again, it was, it was closed off. There was a fence and all of that, and it was over a hill. Well, um, I told people to relax for a while, get a Coke or whatever. We just finished seeing the city of Corinth. And while they were looking around, I climbed the fence. <laughs> Believe me, there was no sign that said, thou shalt not trot on the sod. So I felt, hey, what, you know, they can only throw me out. So I climbed the fence and I went down there. I'm searching all over the place and I'm getting frustrated. Then I hear the bus honking up on the hill. Everybody's ready to go. And what's he doing down there? You know, I'm way down the hill and I'm running all over the place. I found the ancient amphitheater site and I knew it was somewhere out in front. I had heard from an archeology span friend of mine, archeologist. So I'm hunting all over, I can't find it. I'm frustrated. They're yelling and screaming at the top. I says, Lord, I want to see that for myself. And I looked down and I was standing on it. <laughs> I'm not putting you on. I got pictures of the thing. Erastus' name is, a, is grounded out in stone, in a slab of stone, right in front of the amphitheater. What a neat little confirmation of the Word of God because Paul mentions him. And here again, Erastus stayed in Corinth. He was a public official there, a city treasurer, but the gospel had reached his heart, and he became a wonderful friend to Paul. His remarks reveal his concern. The third thing I draw to your attention about the support and delight of friends is that his remembrances show me that God has his people everywhere. Look in verse 21. He says to Timothy, Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. You say, well, why did that speak to you in that way? Why does that show that his remembrance of this, that God has his people everywhere? Well, the interesting thing to me is none of these people are mentioned anywhere else. And yet at the end of the book of Romans, there's a long list of Roman Christians. These are additional ones. That tells me that Paul never stopped his evangelistic work. He wasn't satisfied because there's a whole group of people who had come to know the Lord, whom he referred to in Romans 16. These are all brand new. Maybe the rest of them are all included in all the brethren, that end, ending phrase of verse 21. Now turn back to Romans 16 and let me show you why this is a blessing. Turn back to Romans 16. And pick it up at verse 5. Romans 16, verse 5. And let me show you why it's a blessing. God has people everywhere who can be a blessing to your heart. Paul had not even been to Rome when he's talking about sending along greetings to all these people that he knew were there. Verse 5. Greet my beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trophina and Trophosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother in mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. I don't know if anybody here has a living Bible, but right here is a passage I check out on the living Bible. Greet one another with a holy handshake. Anybody got that? You know, if it's a handshake, I want to know how, how do you have an unholy one? We're talking kiss here. We're talking deep affection. And what I have to say to you, I say with a certain degree of reserve in our kind of a society, but I think we better hear it. You know, in societies where they don't have freedom, where I've had the privilege of being, I have discovered that there is a great outburst of affection among the Christians. That's holy and right and proper and wonderful. But here in America, it seems awful carnal to me. 
Now, I'll never forget being in Soviet Union, where the hugs are quite strong, I might say, where one wonders if his back will still be in condition after being hugged by a Soviet believer. But I remember that very well because one of the dear brothers told me that the reason why this goes on is because they don't know if this is the last time that they will see each other. You know, that's the way it was when the church started. Christians hiding out in the catacombs. They tell us that often when they left each other just to go somewhere, there would be a lot of tears and crying because they weren't sure that they'd see each other again. Well, we take a lot for granted, don't we? We really do. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4 again. How special and precious are your Christian friends? No matter what your disagreements are with them, how special are they? They love the Lord. You're going to be with them forever. Interesting. One last thing. His recognition of the Lord's presence and grace encourages us all. And it was intended to be that. There's a very interesting change in the pronouns in verse 22. All the way up to this verse, he's been using the singular, talking to Timothy. The letter is addressed to Timothy. But in verse 22, he changes it to the plural. The word your is plural, not singular. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, which means the epistle is not just for Timothy, but is intended for all the believers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. And I thought, how fitting. The Lord's presence is what encouraged him in his hour of loneliness and need. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20. The Lord said in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you. Lo, I'm with you always, Matthew 28. Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Demas has forsaken me. Same word, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The presence of the Lord, the Lord be with your spirit. And grace be with you all. It is the grace of our Lord, according to 1 Peter 5, 8 to 10, that strengthens us in all of our trials. God's grace giving to us what we don't deserve. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 that God's grace is sufficient for every need and that in our weakness, God's strength could be seen. What a fitting conclusion to Paul's whole life. Grace, God's grace that gives you what you don't deserve, be with you. Amen. To conclude it all, according to tradition, only tradition, Paul was released by an escape. I do not know if this is true or not, but tradition tells us that a handful of believers fearing for Paul actually pulled off an escape out of the Mamertine prison, overpowered a guard, and by means of a rope pulled him out through the hole in the roof of that dungeon and escaped. And at a place outside of the city, he was finally overtaken by Roman soldiers, and he was killed. There's a church commemorating that which um, I don't recommend, you know, what they've done to that. But it's a strong tradition. According to the tradition, the Apostle Paul did not want this to take place. Kind of reminds me back in Acts when Christians begged him not to go to Jerusalem because they knew what would happen to him. And in fact, it did happen. But Paul said, the will of the Lord be done. And according to the record, Paul was not violating the will of God because it was the will of God that he'd be arrested so he'd eventually get to Rome to share the gospel. I do not know whether these facts are true or not, but I know that this is his final word. And I want to remind you of just one verse. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The Greek is the word in English to spend. I've already been spent. And the time of my departure is at hand. There's such confidence in his heart, in spite of his circumstances, that the will of God has been done in his life. How about you? Can you go to bed tonight and believe that the will of God has been done in your life? And to him be all the glory and all the praise. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your wonderful word. And there are a lot of little notes here at the end of this epistle that make us wonder about those people and those relationships. And we have some facts, but many of them are missing. Lord, I see many principles here for all of us. We need to take a stand for you. And we need to be strong in the Lord when people criticize us or attack us or refuse our message.
want nothing to do with us or even hostile to us. Thank you for the encouragement that you will stand with us. You will deliver us from every evil work and preserve us until the heavenly kingdom. May our eyes be on you, Lord. May we look forward to that wonderful day when we will see Jesus face to face. God, I do not know the hearts of people here as to where they stand. And though we've talked to Christians, there may be some in our midst that really don't know the Lord and have no confidence that they'll ever be in that heavenly kingdom. God, I pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would draw them to the Lord Jesus, who is our Savior and Lord. And to those of us who know you, God, we need to be challenged by your word. It's easy for us to give up and get discouraged and hurt by many of the relationships for which we should be praising you. God, I ask you to restore and encourage Christian relationships among us, that we get strong in the Lord, praying for one another, encouraging one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. Lord, help us to consider how to stimulate and encourage one another to love and good works. Thank you, Lord, for what you can do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.